Thank you, Doug, for the inspiration. It's always uh, profound when Doug plays, especially because we know that when he's not here, we miss him. Yeah. You know, there are some people that when they are not in church, we don't miss them because we never see them doing much. And, uh, and I'm saying this, we have to miss everyone here. Don't you feel like that? Uh, I'm very glad that uh, in these last weeks we are talking about service. And uh, Doug, you are a proof that service is important in our church. And I'm going to talk more about service. Remember that two weeks ago we talked about service and uh, the title of the message was? Remember? It was the glory of service. Part one and two. But I put everything packaged in one because I've been, I've been not preaching here in the last two Sabbaths. So uh, I put the glory of service one and two together last Sabbath. Uh, the last Sabbath we, we spoke, two Sabbaths ago. By the way, Lisa, thank you very much for bringing that message right in the middle that was so important. Because it talks about you cannot have service without what? Family. Unity, family. And what a blessing to have that. And today I'm going to continue with the same story, um, with the same focus. We are talking about the glory of service. Now, let me just make sure that we get this in the same page. All right? By the way, all the ones that are visiting us today, you are more than welcome. It's a pleasure to see you. And uh, we have some faces here that we don't see a long time. But uh, you are always um, in, our, in our minds and ears, I believe, because we keep hearing your songs. I have them in my iPod. You know, people say, what do you have in your iPod? <laughs> do, do, do they ask those questions ag again? I have the, the beautiful quartet that we have been singing here, so thank you very much for that. And uh, we have also some visitors for the first time. I see you. Welcome. It is a pleasure. And Rebecca, uh, we learned to love you already. So <laughs> welcome to, our, in, uh, to be with us today. And uh, we don't have to say anything about Bonnie. You are more than welcome, and we are happy to see you all. And uh, Samia, bem-vinda. I have to say that in Portuguese, as you know. Samia is from Brazil. It's our f a friend now, and she's going to be attending here, if you allow. Do you allow Samia to attend here? Yeah. We don't have to take a vote for that. <laughs> all right. Uh, when, let me just revise real quick what we talked about before. When we talked about, we, we talk about the glory of God was manifested by his presence. And the glory of God manifested by his presence in our understanding and in our contribution for all this process of revealing the glory of God to others, we do that through our service. When we serve wholeheartedly. By the way, you want an example of serving wholeheartedly? You hear what I say about Doug already? Have you seen Amelda? Uh, offer presentation. She's looking at me and saying, I hate you, Pastor, for doing this right now. <laughs> but you know what service wholeheartedly is just. She was not scheduled to do that. Right, Danny? She said, I volunteer. And she did as she was memorizing this whole week. So thank you for that, Amelia, because that's an example that we need to follow. Service to God. When we serve Him wholeheartedly, we present God to others. Now, uh, the, the, the series of, uh, the, uh, 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 when we talk about the part two, we talk about the gifts that God gives us. And as we have the gifts of God to do this service, we use them according to what God gives us, but we have to use what we got. Right? And I say to you guys, are we using what God gives you? And the last part of this series, which is today, I'm going to talk about something that I'm not proud of. The part that I was not using, what God gave me. The part that I was running from God. And after two years, I think I have the right to share my story, if you allow me. So, it was a, um, I, I cannot say it was a Sunday night or a Monday night. I don't remember quite well. But I remember that I was working on a special evangelistic week. A pastor had invited me because um, I was in New York. I was an elder of a church. 
And my pastor, my, one of my good friends, he was at the conference as a ministerial director and Sabbath school director. And he was getting many invitations to go doing preachings and, and, and series in the weeks. And, and he couldn't do it all. So a specific one, especially for the Spanish-speaking or Portuguese-speaking, he would invite me to go and say, can you do this week? And I had three weeks already set for that, uh, for that uh, year, three evangelistic weeks. And I was so happy about it because I was serving the Lord. And um, I came to this church, the Williamsburg Spanish Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was interesting because we parked our cars, we had our two boys, and uh, my wife would grab the boys along, and she would be there with me every night. And uh, on that specific night, we started on Saturday, and on that specific night, I was going up. This church is interesting. You open the door and have a little staircase before you go to the sanctuary, something similar to Nashua. When you go to that staircase, very steep. And uh, as I was going up, the pastor of that church was standing right, right on top. So it was something like this. He was looking down on me. And I was going up. He had a very authorita authoritative voice. He said, I have a message for you. And as I was going up, and I said, oh, a message for me. You could have called me. He said, no, I have a message from Pastor Santos, who was the pastor of the conference that was inviting me to go around these churches. And I said, well, if it was Pastor Santos, why, did he, why he didn't call me? <laughs> you know, we can talk. I have his number. He can text, whatever. At the time, I don't think we had text. We had a, I had a beeper. <laughs> I had a beeper. He could beep me. As the pastor was standing down, looking down to me, he said, I have a message for you. And I said, go ahead. What's the message? And the message was simple. He said, why are you rejecting God's call? And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on there, pastor. Who are you talking to? Me, the guy who's at your church doing an evangelistic series that you should be doing, you're telling me this? That's what I thought. I didn't say that to him, of course. <laughs> but I said, who is talking? What is he talking about? Me? What call was I rejecting? Life was good at that time. I cannot lie. This was my wife and my two boys. We had a beautiful family. And as you know, they're still around, so you know them. Uh, Jeff and William, uh, we used to go around, we used to go to places, visit together. Yeah, William. William is wearing a suit there. But yeah, Jeff used to <laughs> dress up all the time. And uh, right that, at that moment, we had just purchased our beautiful house. It was in Long Island, New York. It was a nice house, 4,900 square feet or whatever you call that. It was a transformed house. It was a beautiful thing. We had a plan to open a daycare, and um, Yvonne had asked for authorization. She had authorization already. It was a big backyard, and it was close to the harbor. We are so proud of it. And uh, well, life was doing well. And uh, I was attending this beautiful church, still there, if you have an opportunity to visit the Glencove Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a beautiful church in Glencove, right there in the northern, part, the northern part of Long Island. I was an elder of the church, and I was serving. I was working with the church. I was preaching. But there was one thing. I thought that I was doing everything God wanted me to do. But that was not true. I knew there was something missing. Because I don't know if it happens to you, but what is your calling? You know what God calls you to do. You know when God calls you to do something, and you can easily rationalize and say, well, there are other people playing the piano. <laughs> well, there are other people there that are more capable for the eldership position. Well, I don't need to get that role of, you know, head deacon. That's too much work. Well, 
I agree with it so little. Let somebody else do it. I'll be here doing nothing. What is your calling? Well, I'm saying all those things because we are going through a nominating committee. Trust me, as we go through the names, something sometimes pops up like, oh, that person will never take that. That's an offense, isn't it? How can we say that person will never take that if that's his calling? But you know what is your calling. I'm not here to tell you what God's calling you for. I'm not here to tell you what is the invitation that the Holy Spirit is doing to your heart that you know you can accept or not. And I knew that I was called to serve the Lord completely. By the way, I was on a, a special visa at the time where I could do a part-time only for the church. And I could do a part-time for myself. And well, guess what? Myself pays better. Oh, yeah. Myself pays a lot better than the church. But I was just a part-time. So life could be good. I had a call. I believe that uh, this text spoke very much of what I believed in my heart that time. It says, there is no line of work in which it is possible for the youth to receive greater benefit. And I thought to myself, hey, hold on a second. I want to be that youth to get greater benefit. What is that about? All who engage in ministry are God's helping hand. Opa. Ministry? So you're calling me to be a minister, Lord? Yes, you can be a helping hand. They are co-workers with the angels. Rather, they are the human agencies through whom the angels accomplish their mission. Look at that. Our angels speak through their voices and work by their hands. And the human workers cooperating with heavenly agencies have the perfect of their education and experience, have the benefit of their education and experience. As a means of education, what university course can equal this? I had this in my mind. Doesn't matter what I'm going to school for, I'm going for theology. I want to be a minister. That was my understanding of my calling. And I said, oh, well, I'm going to be a minister. But that was back in 1994. Suddenly, the, the thing changed. I, was, uh, I came as a volunteer. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But in 1994, look at this group of people, very nice people. This first one here in the corner on the, on the right, now he's at the general conference, uh, he's the director of missions at the general conference. The guy next to him, right here, let me see if I can point this right, yeah, right here. He has a ministry for secularized individuals. His church is at a bar. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> the next one, he was a missionary also. He was a missionary in, in Dubai, and now he's at Andrews University teaching pastors how to do mission. Isn't that great? And now, it's me. Now, this guy, he's a director for youth in South Brazil. He's a pastor in Brazil, and he's a pastor in Brazil. Isn't that great that all these people, they continue serving the Lord? I was the only one who skipped out. And I went to, a, I, went to I was doing part-time. Well, there's uh, something more that I want to share you. And this is what I want you to open your Bible real quick. Romans chapter 10. Now, you see, the chapter 10 of Romans, Paul is really talking to how Israel needed the gospel. And how Israel needed to be connected with the Lord. And not only Israel, Paul says, the Gentiles too. But everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be Saved. Romans 10 verses 13. What does it say? For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> but then the question comes. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How somebody's going to say, Lord, save me, if they have not believed in that Lord? How are they going to say, and how shall they believe in him if they never heard of him? And Paul continues question, uh, questioning. And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear without a preacher? And then Paul quotes one text of Isaiah. Then he says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it's written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. 
when I heard that, I said, well, I want to have beautiful feet. I want to be involved in this preaching part. That's something that I want to do. That was my personal calling. By the way, let me open a parenthesis here. Uh, two weeks ago, the, the North American Division have this um, presentation done where they have said, that was the, the, the um, fall uh, meeting of the North American Division, and they have presented with all the numbers. If no new church is opened in the United States, if no new pastor is needed, only the ones that we have, considering the ones that are retiring, from, and I'm not talking about, okay, I think I'm going to retire because I'm 65. No, I'm talking about the ones that are above 65 to 75. All the pastors that are retiring in the next five years, we are running low of 140 pastors per year. Because the ones studying, okay, and the ones that are being called to other places, don't, don't add up to the numbers that we're losing. What does it tell you? That we need people who say, I want to take a break of whatever I do, and I want to go for ministry. And I was looking for, and you say, well, what age pastor is appropriate? Any age before 65 is appropriate. <laughs> Why? Because we're losing everybody 65 and up. So if you still have some gas there to give to the Lord, be my guest. Take the call. Close parenthesis. Ellen says that there is an urgent demand for laborers in gospel fields, but the young men are needed for this work. God calls them. Now, God, God calls young men and women, but now there's, a, there's an issue here. Some people say, please, don't do theology. They don't pay well. You're going to be you know, moving a lot. and this, blah, blah, blah. Look at that. <clears throat> Their education of primary importance in our cards in no case should be ignored or, or regarded as a secondary matter. It is entirely wrong for teachers, by suggesting other occupations, occupations to discourage young men who might be qualified to do acceptable work, uh, acceptable work in ministry. That means if a teacher, a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an elder in the church says to someone, well... Theology is good, but why don't you go for, you know, law? It's better. You're going to make more money. Or why don't you go for... Okay? Why it's wrong? Because those who present hindrances to prevent the young men from feeding themselves for this work are counterworking the plans of God. So if God has a plan for someone in this church, a young boy, a young girl, to serve in ministry... And we encourage them to go, otherwise, we are doing what? Counterworking the plan of God. So let's be careful. Let's encourage people, serve. What is your call? Not everybody has a call, but what is yours? Now, then I was in 1994, uh, standing with my group of friends, and that was my second year of theology. I, need, I just needed another two more years, and I was gone, and I would be going to the field, and I got this advertisement in the school saying, missionary needed in Africa, volunteers only, signed up, we need two places. And I said, whoa, that's for me. My father was a missionary. I grew up in the missionary field. I speak a little bit of English, a little bit of French. I can go there and I can, I can do this. <laughs> Sign up. Put my papers on. Here's my CV. Everybody, <laughs> no, nothing my CV. Right? They look there. Okay, yeah, we're going to put your name there. And, and then they put their name. Suddenly, I come back from, I went actually to say goodbye to my brother in his house. And he was married. I came came back to school, I was walking, saying, okay, when is the call coming? Oh, the call, the call came from Africa. They select so-and-so there. His name is Adriano. And I said, what? How do you select somebody else? Let me get this. And I went to talk to the, to the, to the dean, and the dean told me, oh, uh, yes, uh, your name went there, they discuss it, but uh, don't you have a problem in your back? Right be before that year, in the beginning of that year, I had fa fallen from a tree, and I had hit my back a little bit. It was okay. I went to school with a wheelchair for a, one month, but that, 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 that was, didn't matter anything. I said, give me a good, solid mattress. I can be good. 
And they say, well, because of your back problem, we, take your, we took your name out, not as an option. So we sent the other two names to them. I said, that's not possible. How would you do that to me? So that's what happened. A couple of days later, the second fax came from the, for the other guy. So I went to talk to him and say, wow, I'm so glad you got the call, right? He said, yeah, here, look at this fax. It was a page. He said, but I'm not going. I said, what? I'm not going. Why are you not going? Well, things are difficult. You know, Angola is a war. It's a war that's been for 30 years. I don't think I want to go there. And I said, can I have your fax? He said, yeah, but it's addressed to me. Can I have it? I grabbed the fax and went to the dean and said, Dean, here, he doesn't want to go, I want to go. Well, good, but it's not up to me. You have to talk to the next guy there, the school president. Let, let him talk to you. And I went to the school president, he sat me down. This is the top guy in the, in the university. He sat me down for one hour and he tried to convince me how hard it is to carry boxes when you have a broken back. back. And he was telling me, you are going to go places, you don't know how the thing is. You have a, you're going to give more problems to the church than helping the church. And I said, yes, I know, I want to go. He said, well, it's not up to me. Why don't you call the division guy because he's the one who called, gave us the call. Talk to him. And this is me going to the school there, to the place where we made phone calls. And Who's, who's at the division? So I want to talk to the person that's responsible for this, and I gave the name, and we start calling the division now. The division guy took the five in Angola in, in November 1st, 1994, along with my friend Adriano, who I, in school I did not meet him very well. I, we just knew a little bit about each other, but we traveled together, and we became best friends. He's my best friend today, uh, like a brother. You like that? That was fancy in 1994. Don't forget that. I was a fancy guy then. And the activities in Angola were nice. I was very happy. We built, uh, this is a health post that we're building. We paid the workers with food and clothes. This is another church. You see the church was all covered with, uh, um, how do you call that, like a says kind of, oh yeah, thinking about that. Yeah, it was cotton, right? <laughs> Look very, very, very difficult. But those are the churches that were being there. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. When they knew that they have visitors, they would decorate the church with paper so we would walk in and feel welcome. Isn't that great? The whole church was decorated for the, 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 the service. So Angola was a blessing. I met this pastor here. He was a nice guy. I'm going to tell a little bit about him right after this. I also meet this other pastor here that I'm going to talk about him a little bit more. And then I met, I met this girl. You know her? Yeah, I met her at the airport. It was love at first sight. It was simply a God thing. I was praying a week before. Lord, I don't want to be, you know, here in Angola after seven. Because, by the way, I went there. It was a six-month call. It was three years and a half when I started praying for the Lord that I, I need to meet someone because, you know, all my friends are graduating. They got married. They are going moving on with their lives. And I was in Africa because I loved so much the work that I wanted to stay there longer. And then my wife showed up at the airport, and I went to pick her up, and we never uh, step, you know, stay away from each other later on. We decided at that moment, serving in Africa, that that would be our lives. We say, our lives will be of service, and we are going to do together. And that was our plan. We came to the United States. We started helping the church. We were so happy. But then... Again, working for yourself is good. And the life was nice. My first child was born. We bought our first house. We got our first, second car. And then we got our third car. My, my boss, when he sold this nice, beautiful, silver spirit Rolls Royce, he said to me, this is going to help you make a lot of money. That was pre-2008. We'd go to somebody else, somebody selling a house, and we could offer them whatever they're asking for the price. We will go back home. Before we reach the office, that house would be higher in value. We could appraise it very high, and the difference, we'll, sell, we'll pocket because we'll flip the house real quick without doing anything in the house. That was a beautiful time. 
And with somebody would believe you when you stop with a Rolls Royce and say, I can close it cash in 30 days. They'll say, okay, that's <laughs> And I'll work hard in 30 days and get a, a bank loan. <sighs> okay, no more talking about that. Then is when we got there. Life was good. And we say, isn't that God great that God is blessing us? Isn't that great that we serve him part-time, but God is blessing us? So we bought that house that I mentioned to you that had that, this nice backyard right here. And then we, one day we were looking back from the porch and we were saying, what we put here in the back? It's too big. I think a swimming pool would be nice. So our kids, when they are teenagers, they can just come, jump in the backyard with their friends. And it hit me so hard that I was talking about having teenage kids. Many years later, in the same house, what about the commitment to serve the Lord, to travel around the world preaching and helping other people? And when he hit us that afternoon, it complemented with that question they asked me in that church. Why are you rejecting God's call? And I started thinking about that. Why was I rejecting God's call? Because for sure, I knew that the Lord was calling me for ministry. And I was trying to be reluctant. I believe today, looking back, that I was comfortable. You know, Ellen White's uh, gospel workers, she say, Ministers should have no separate interest aside from the great work of leading souls to the truth. Their energies are all needed here. They should not engage in traffic of any kind or in business aside from this great work. Part-time pastors. I'm sorry, that's not the recommendation. I'm not criticized, I'm not saying anything. Done that, been there. Doesn't work for me. My attention was business. I can get things done. I was not called to be a part-time pastor. And I said, I want to dedicate my life completely for that. Talking about dedicating your life, I mentioned to you about this pastor. And these are pastors that I met before I decided to be a minister. I met when I was in Angola. And I knew I, I had my calling, but I said, I will never do what this guy did. This church, to have this baptism, this is the first baptism of a church that was in the middle of UNITA, uh, rebel area. I met a guy one day talking to the UNITA representatives when I was leaving the car, uh, was leaving the office. I came to my car and somebody was standing on the corner just looking at me very from far and I was in the rebel area. And I said, what does this guy want with me? And suddenly I see that this guy was coming closer and I was getting, close my door. You know, you do this, you close the pin of the, the lock, and my window, instead of rolling down, I rolled it up, and I turned the car, and I was about to pull when he just knocked at the window. Say, hey, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, okay, what does this guy want? I give this amount of <laughs> window room for him. And I said, hi, how can I help you, sir? He said, are you from Adra? And I said, yeah, I am from Adra. Guess what? I had the Adra stamped in my door. <laughs> he could read that and obviously he'll know that I'm from Adra. What are you, know, you know? And I said to him, yes, I'm from Adra. And then he said, are you from the Adventist Adra? <laughs> oh, now it's a different story. And I put down the window and I said, yes, do you know the Adventist Adra? And he said, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. Oh, and I said, oh, that's nice. Then I got out of the car and started talking to him. Brother, so how are you doing? How would you end up here? He said, I'm the leader of the church here. I said, no, you're not. Before I go to that town, I knew that that town did not have a Seventh-day Adventist church. And then he said, yeah, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. There's no church here in this town. He said, that's what you think. <laughs> and I said, okay. So tell me more about it. We have more than 100 Seventh-day Adventist members meeting here. UNITA, because of the rebel activities, they, what do they would do, they would bring people from different areas of the country. And this 
specific town, they have brought different people from other areas and alongside them the Seventh-day Adventists. So they had a church of 140, 150 people that the conference did not even know they existed. A Seventh-day Adventist church that was not in our books. So when they tell us about this 23 million people that we have around the world, I always remember this Kakulama church that was not even in the books. Was not even in the books. And this ca they, they came and said, I want you to come next Sabbath. I came, I visited them, I brought Bibles, I brought a lot of things. And later on he said, we are having a baptism. This is when I met this pastor. And I said, who is going to baptize? He said, oh, we got a pastor, he's coming. So how did you get it? He's coming from the south. Seven days traveling on the back of a truck. On the back of a truck. Alongside with all the other things that they transported there. Mainly there was cassava dried where they had to, to, to interchange to make, to make a profit. And I said, wow, what a thing. So when I met this guy, when I talked to him, I said, how are you surviving, my friend? He said, I, where I go, they feed me. The conference, don't, we don't have contact with the conference. There's no salaries coming through. And we've been like this for many years. I am a volunteer pastor. But I go where I have to go. He traveled to baptize these people. Eleven people were baptized that day. And uh, I was thinking, would I do that? I'm comfortable. I have a nice car, a nice family, a nice house. Would I go there? Not for me. These are the roads I would drive to visit Yvonne. When we start dating, I'll drive about 45, 50 minutes. Where she, she was living in a camping. Better said, in an encampment. It was a rebel encampment where they would come back from their activities after fighting wars for 30 years. They would come back, they would exchange their guns for a tent for their families, and uh, they would receive health and education. Uh, Yvonne was coordinating all the schools that they would be establishing. So she had about 100 and, or more. How many schools you had? About 100, 400, I don't know. I don't remember anymore, but there was a lot of schools because they had more than 50,000 people were camped there. And, uh, but that was a nice road. You have only one problem, you can't get out of the road because all the side of the roads, uh, th they were mined. So if you have any problem and you get out of the road, you might explode. So rule number one, don't explode. Just stay in the road. And that's simple. We would drive 45 minutes for that. Some of the roads were like that. You had to cross that little part. Some of the roads were like that. This is after we cross. Uh, the car that would drive around, there would be sometimes locked in the middle of a sandy place that I did not calculate it very well, and that meant hours of digging to get the car out of there. But hey, we did many things, and you know, I was thinking, why would I go back to those places? I don't think it's good, because you know, I-95, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Why are you rejecting God's call? I don't know. Probably I was afraid. And I think that, um, uh, look what Ellen White talks about the gospel works. She said, it's a wonderful how strong a weak man may become through faith in the power of God. How decided his efforts, how prolific of great results. Angola was not an easy place to be. Everywhere we would go to visit different cities, we would find these things. You know, bullet ridden buildings, we would find uh, buildings with, uh, that have been shelled before. People were living in this building, by the way. People are still living there. Um, these are uh, bridges that uh, we had to cross. Sometimes they just made another way around, but we, <laughs> we would go back there to check the bridge. Look at this, this is a bomb. This is another bomb. Those are unexploded bombs that were thrown on top of this building, uh, this bridge, and some of them exploded, the bridge fell, but some of them did not explode. So you'd go there and it would be, oh, this is nice. Let me see, so I take pictures of the thing. And later on, think this thing could explode and that will be parted in bits. Oh, God is great. 
Every time they would stop. This is the, if you drive on the road and you get out a little bit on the road, you, we couldn't go far. I mentioned to you, those are minefields, but we would find that. Little pieces of people that just stay there on the wrong side of the road. Uh, one time we went to this hospital right after the government came and took the place away from the rebels. And the people that are trying to run, they walk into the hospital, the, they burn them alive. And uh, we found this when we got there. But at this place here, uh, there was the, uh, one day I was in my office and I got a radio call from uh, uh, the Doctors Without Borders, MSF, Medicine uh, Sans Frontier. The Doctors Without Borders, they had projects in areas that we didn't. So we, we s when we separated, when we mapped out the activities, there were some villages that we would not go because Doctors Without Borders were there. And one day they called me on the radio and they say, uh, Jeff, we want to talk to you about uh, quality. And I said, okay, yeah, go ahead. And they say, you know the mission that the Seventh-day Adventist Church had in quality? And I knew that in the past, in 1960, 1940s, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had about six missions in Angola, all spread out. And doctors would fly from the United States, they had planes, they would go to the, there, and some doctors would be working in more than one mission. And quality mission was one of them. They had an airstrip, and people would fly there. Uh, doctors from, from America would fly there. And these missions were great for the population. By the way, if you go to any of those missions today, around 70% of the population, for miles, are all Seventh-day Adventists because of the influence of this. Uh, one time I was going to this mission when we heard that the mission was still standing. And I said, that's not possible. All the information we had is that these missions were destroyed. But Doctors Without Borders told me, no, I went there, I visited the mission, you have glasses on the windows. And I didn't believe it. So I said, let me go there. And they said, okay, arrange the trip. So we arranged, we flew to a diff uh, another town, and from there we took the car. It was about, if you look at the map, it's about 150 kilometers or less than 80 miles or 90 miles but we will take nine hours to go over there because of the roads that I showed you. And uh, when we got there, we went and I met this pastor. His name is David Funata. He was a pastor of the church and the church was standing and the buildings were standing. Everything was there, the hospital, the houses where the missionaries lived, everything was standing. And I say, it's not possible because we just drove by a Catholic mission. It was raised to the ground. There was not even a single wall. And our mission standing said, they protected this mission because they know this was a Seventh-day Adventist mission. They didn't touch it. And I said, that's great. So I went to the schools. I have a video I could show you. And we went to the schools. The school classes are there. They're still having classes of the, of the rebels, the UNITA, are having classes there. And I said, what can we do to reopen this mission right away? So I went to the Unita leaders there, and they said, oh, that's nice. You want to bring foreigners here? Yes, I want to bring a missionary back here. I want to bring a doctor here. I want to bring a, a nurse here. Can we do that? Yes, you can do that. So I went back to Luanda, the capital city, and I wrote uh, to the president of the union, who had studied in this mission. He came, he hugged me, he, they cried, you have to see. These are people that did not see the mission for many years. This mission had no access to people that were in the government areas. They wouldn't see that. They, when they seen the videos with the, with the builders, they were crying, crying of joy. And they're saying, thank God. They say, I'm gonna write a project for the division and we are going to ask for funds. They say, do that. And we wrote a project, $80,000 project. It was very, very small. But we asked a pastor to come to, to run the mission alongside with Pastor Funata. Pastor Funata had 52 churches, by the way. If you complain about this pastor having two, he had 52. And he told me, I have him in the video saying, for me, the biggest challenge is that I have to be in the water for hours when we baptize people because everybody brings the people to be baptized and I stay there for hours. Please bring us some bicycles. We need bicycles. We don't have, we have people to go. So it was a beautiful story. But when we start asking for volunteers to come, we got a doctor from Mexico, decided to come there. We had a nurse from Brazil and we had a pastor and a teacher 
also from Brazil, allowing us to restart the mission. And uh, I think this thing died here. I need somebody helping in the back. Um, let me see, I can do it from here. All right, so the pastor from the mission was my father. He said, I'll go, you there, you're gonna give us some support. I'll be there in the mission field too. I wanna be a volunteer. So he quit Brazil uh, and my wife and they flew to Africa. Look at my father, he was younger than I am today. Isn't that wonderful? And he came there as a volunteer and as he was there, seven weeks in, when he was there, we start having a discussion with um, the central government of the rebels about reopening the mission. We have authorization for that. The local UNITA branch, the rebels, have authorized us also to reopen the, th the, the mission. But coming closer to the movement uh, of my father reopened the airstrip with the, the church members. Imagine, they say, let's reopen the airstrip. Yeah, they got machetes and they went there to cut the grass and they step on it and that's it. And they asked me, what is the measurement of airstrip? I did not remember the measurement. I remember I mentioned to you when we saw the, the CA-130 in the, in the, the Hercules plane needed 800 meters by 30 to land. And that's the only measurement I remember. So I said to my father, 800 by 30, gotta be 800 by 30. You can land a huge Hercules filled with soldiers. So Unita said, uh-oh, this is a problem for us. On the day that we needed to land with representatives from the division who gave us the money to start, Unita local branch decided, no, 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 we don't want them here. We want them out. The government, the, 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 the regional uh, government had given us authorization to land the locals said no. So when we started landing, we saw a guy with a red uh, flag right in the beginning of the, of the field, and the pilot said, well, there's a guy there, but uh, we're not gonna listen to him, let's land. So we land the plane. When we land the plane, we were surrounded by the guerrilla people shouting to us, saying, take it off, take off, take off. Nobody, nobody lands. And I got down and I started having an argument with this individual. And we spoke for about an hour, back and forth. Listen, these guys are from the church. They just want to see, no locals then. No locals will get down, no locals, okay. Just the foreigners, let us go. No, no, we don't want to see anybody. And I, I said, let them go. Listen, I was dealing with this guy and I said, let them go, let them go visit. And they went to visit, but they ruined the whole program. They didn't allow us to be there for long. Uh, we stayed there for about an hour, we took off, but it was enough for us to see the multitude of believers around the plane and everybody happy. That was on a Sunday, on a Tuesday evening, uh, they came, the dele delegation of uh, the UNITA came to my father's house. And we are set to go on Thursday night to travel on Thursday to that, uh, to that, uh, to that place from where I lived. And uh, I was with Yvonne, we were dating at the time, and I said, you wanna come along? We can go there and we can uh, spend the weekend with my parents in his house. And uh, we bring all this uh, con convoy of vehicles with uh, you know, diesel and, and things that you need, they need. And she agreed with me, so Thursday morning when I woke up, I had this sh assurance that I shouldn't travel that day. You know when you have that feeling that you knew that something is telling you don't travel today. So I called Ivan and I said, You're not, we're not going today, let's go on Sunday. Let's spend the weekend here, let's spend the Sabbath together. Sunday we go to this trip. So that's what we did. We spent the Sabbath going to church with different members, we preached in a church. When we came back, uh, it was almost uh, evening, about six or seven o'clock at night. Uh, the director of MSF sent me a radio uh, and he said, uh, Jeff, can you stop by our office right now? Um, actually, it was not a radio, it was a, his guard. His guard from MSF came and he said, um, our director, Mr. Mauro, wants to talk to you right now. Can you come? And I said, yes. So I followed him. It was a couple of blocks and uh, when we got into the office of Doctors Without Borders, he looked at me and said, I need you to sit down. 
I have bad news. And I said, okay, what's the news? The mission of Kuali was attacked by the rebels Thursday night. And um, your father is hurt, gravely hurt. We don't know anything. We just know that he is very hurt. And I said, what kind of hurt? Is, is he shot? Is he? He said, we don't know. This was Saturday night, when Thursday night they have told us that, you know, was the attack. So I immediately went to UN to report to them, and uh, we started to report, and just what the UN did, it was just reporting. <laughs> they wouldn't do anything to move a finger. And we went back to MSF, uh, to MSF, and we decided to have a flight brought so we could uh, evacuate the missionaries from the, 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 the field. The government of uh, UNITA did not allow us to land in the place. They say land in a close by city was around four hours. And uh, we sent a car to go pick them up and bring them back to this town. So we flew to that town with the plane. And when we got there, uh, we got the, the, the right, the, the, the true story. When, the, when Medicals Without Borders came to the, the field, they already radiated saying, they're still alive, he has some bad shape, head. My father was beaten badly. By the way, he told us on Thursday evening, around two o'clock in the morning, he heard a truck coming closer and stopping at a certain distance. And he heard the diesel truck that woke him up. Suddenly, he started hearing people throwing stones towards the house. So one of the windows got broken, so he came to the front door, and as he comes to the front door to, to say, let's have a talk, they had already their AK-47s breaking the door through and walk in. They walked thro towards him, grab him by the hair, pull him out, and start the kicking. My father doesn't remember how long it took. Originally, he told us about 45 minutes. I believe that was not long, uh, that long because, you know, when you're getting kicked in the face, you don't know how long it took. Three, four, five times would do the damage, and they did. It broke his face in, four in three parts. And they continue kicking him to the point that one of his kidneys don't work today. But he survived. His head was this big. The soldiers got into the house, and uh, my, my mother came to, to, uh, to talk to them. And they pushed her in the bed. And it was, was Arnis who got slapped, right? Oh, my mom got slapped. OK. They slapped my mother, threw her in the bed, and Arnis she hide under the bed. Yeah, she was smart. She hide under the bed, and my mom uh, was thrown in, in on top of the bed. And uh, they start breaking everything. They didn't do any harm to the ladies. And uh, they left the house. They didn't steal nothing. There was food. My mom say, still complains today that it was a cake. They end up eating it. Everything else, they didn't do anything. They just broke everything. They broke all the equipment. They broke all the all the things. They didn't even steal a generator, which is a very priceful thing. They didn't do it. Th there was a car standing there. They broke the car and nothing else. They just didn't do anything. They went specifically to hurt them, specifically to take them out. They continue saying there, we couldn't find anybody else. This is just them. They are here. My father tells us later that that was on Thursday evening. On Tuesday, the, soldier, the, the rebels came to visit my father. And uh, they asked about me, because I was the one having the discussion on the airfield. And my mom said, oh, yes, he's our son. And he's coming Thursday night. <laughs> so you might expect that they try to direct that into, if I was there, I don't think I would be as lucky as my father was. So I understood that completely. and I. We left Angola right after that because we couldn't trust the UNITA to work with them anymore. It was very difficult. My father healed. He stayed in the country for another year, and then he left too. But to be quite sincere, I was afraid. Our dream long, <laughs> our long dream was to come back to Africa one day. But I was not ready for it. And of course, 
when the questions would come to us and the, the people would say, listen to this, you would like to serve? Well, I believe in that. No higher office is given to man. No joy can equal the assurance of being an instrument of the hand of God for saving souls. It is a grand thing to look back upon a course of labor, all marked with glorious results, to see precious souls progressing in the light through your efforts. That call is for you. Don't you want to see people accepting Jesus because of your involvement? Don't you want to see Jesus uh, changing the lives of people because you are talking to them? Yeah. The call is for everybody. Yeah. But when we, have, we are confronted with that <laughs> interesting question, why are you rejecting God's call? At one point, right after that, we say, we can't be doing this. Our lives were not going to be complete if we don't serve the Lord wholeheartedly. So we decided to go to Peru. And Peru brought us many good things. It brought us Ivana. <laughs> it brought us um, my graduation. Uh, Ivana was working with the kids immediately on the, on the, on the, on the three to four year uh, early childhood education there. We had many friends. After Peru, we were called to go to the Amazon. And that was the best times in our lives because our kids start getting involved in all kinds of activities. Missionary work in the Amazon is a very glorious and fruitful work. Everybody loves the church so much. The church is the first stopping. You know, work and it's secondary for them. They go to church. We had the opportunity to go to different places, uh, trainings and occupations. We have worked in Rwanda uh, for about five years, four years and a half. And what a blessing was to be involved in seeing, you know, we are helping people to go out of poverty by, you know, just create ideas of how to plant something or how to, to you know, harvest bee. You know that a traditional bee harvesting would yield three times more if you just tweak a little bit and teach them how to make more money. It's amazing how people transform their lives. When we went back to Brazil, we had continued working with Adra, the implementation of different projects, but <coughs> preaching and, and, and sharing good news is what motivated us. We went back to Peru. You see, our de desire was to serve around the world, and we had the opportunity to do that. And um, eventually, we went back to Sudan, and Sudan was a great opportunity for our families. But the Lord, on His grace, had called us to be here. Amen. So my question is, a boring place to be, right? Yeah. And the question is, what are we going to do here? Yeah. There's nothing we are going to do for the Lord without your calling. Again, let me repeat this. I know my calling, and I want to be strong and faithful to it. But I'm, what about your calling? Probably God's not calling you to go around the world. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everybody should be a full-time pastor. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that I'm sure that you know what God is calling you for. I'm sure that probably is for you to be here more times. Or for you to say, this is part of my journey. I want my family to be here with me. I want my friends to be here with me. I want my friends to look forward to what these wonderful things are going to be on the second coming of Jesus. And I want them to be standing there, not running from it. What is your calling? Whatever the Lord is calling you to, be ready to say yes. Here I am. Send me. Because look at that. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him. Again. This is the quotation that Romans 10, Paul makes from Isaiah. And what it says in Romans, how beautiful are the feet. But it's not about you. It's about where you are is what makes it beautiful. It's not because God is calling you to be special. God is calling you to be upon the mountains. Because how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet. It's about the work that you have to do. Not because of you. It's because there's something special on the work that you do for the ones around you that makes your feet beautiful. You get that? What is the calling that we have today? How beautiful are the feet? 
what beautiful is when we proclaim, your God reigns. Make your God reign in your life for real. Because he's calling you for real. The calling that the Lord is doing for you is not for you to put, brush it aside and say, one day. It's for now. So what is your calling? And what is going to be your response? May God bless you.